you know, you're 46 years old and you still dreaming like you're a teenage kid. Being a professional ballet dancer isn't your typical career. Performers must eat, sleep, and breathe dance, and sometimes even that isn't enough. How do they keep themselves in shape, and what happens when their bodies have had enough? Zoe caved in left home at age 15 and traveled 10,000 miles to attend one of these institutions. It meant saying goodbye to a typical high school experience and settling for seeing her family only twice a year. She says ballet kind of consumes you and admits she has no time left for other activities or a social life. It may seem harsh, but getting started early gives aspiring dancers a huge advantage over those who start later. Many commit to ballet when they're as young as three, and teens who are serious about becoming dancers pack up and head to private ballet boarding schools like Zoe. Even if kids have the drive to start lessons early, few of them have the funds necessary to break into the industry. Let's say an aspiring ballerina starts taking classes at the age of three and attends a mid-tier school for 15 years. By the time they turn 18, they'll have spent $53,000 on just lessons. Then there's the $2,000 in ballet school fees, $15,000 for tights, leotards, and other essentials, and $5,000 for wraps, bandages, stage makeup, and similar supplies. Don't forget $30,000 for point shoes alone. The better dancers get, the more of those expensive and delicate shoes they need. Finally, starting in sixth grade, serious students enroll in summer intensive training programs with a $2,500 tuition and $3,000 room and board. All in all, aspiring performers can expect to shell out $137,000. Ballet dancer Sarah Burroughs claims weigh-ins were a regular part of life at school. She says it wasn't unusual for students to pass out from hunger, and they were praised for losing weight no matter how unhealthy their methods. When Sarah was struck with a flare-up of gastroenteritis, she was congratulated for only weighing 101 pounds and told that was how she should look all the time. Very, very, very thin, as well as dancing 35, 40 hours a week. Psychologist Dr. Linda Hamilton has worked with many ballet dancers and says the pressure to be thin starts early. When puberty hits as early as age 12, dancers' bodies start to change, and it puts even more pressure on them to lose weight. Wanting to be in peak physical shape is one thing, but sadly, many dancers' desperation to be thin results in severe eating disorders. Psychotherapist Dawn Smith Theodore was once a professional dancer and wrote the book Too Too Thin. When her body started to develop, her desire to lose weight led to a battle with anorexia. She thought starving herself would give her an edge, but it only led to serious health issues later on. When Anais Garcia was a ballet dancer, she was constantly told that she was too soft. Her desire to please her teachers caused her to start skipping meals, using laxatives, and over-exercising. Sadly, stories like Anais's are all too common. According to Dr. Hamilton, the ballet culture is sadly conducive to eating disorders. Even when ballet dancers make it as professionals, their schedules remain incredibly demanding. Isabella Boylston is a professional dancer and was Jennifer Lawrence's dance double in Red Sparrow. On an average day, she starts out with an hour and a half long dance class to warm up her body and get ready for her seven hour rehearsal. While sometimes she's able to squeeze in a break, Isabella admits it doesn't always work out and the day can be brutal. If she's going to perform that day, Isabella cuts down her rehearsal to two hours in order to keep herself and her body feeling fresh. Many professional ballet dancers also squeeze exercises like Pilates and swimming into their already packed schedules. And of course, they need to save some time for self-care. Being a professional ballet dancer means protecting your feet at all costs, after you get done punishing them for the day. Ballet slippers may be pricey, but they offer little in the way of protection. Dancer Lauren Levette has an intense regimen for her feet, including daily ankle exercises, physical therapy, ice baths, and topical ointments. According to Dr. Lisa M. Schoen, a dance and sports medicine podiatric physician, getting up on point is one of the most athletic things you can do. Putting that much pressure on toes can cause serious damage. Icing your feet at the end of the day is a bare minimum requirement for being a professional ballet dancer. 
But at the end of the day, there's no way around sustaining some injuries due to the physical demands of ballet. Their strict training schedules lead to repetitive motion injuries as their bodies rack up wear and tear over the countless hours of dancing. Maintaining proper form and techniques can help mitigate the risk, but simple overuse can cause incredibly painful conditions. These include lower back pain and stress fractures, hip and knee issues, and shin splints, just to name a few. All of that lifting and elongation leads to to a lot of back problems, and once a dancer's back is hurt, they'll often compensate by putting pressure on their hips and posterior, which then puts additional stress on those areas. There are many physical demands ballet dancers have to deal with, but the mental load can cause serious issues too. Nobody's perfect is not a thing for dancers who strive for nothing less than absolute perfection. While striving to be the best can be a good thing, it can also have detrimental effects on the mental health of dancers. A 2017 study suggests that people in ballet training have greater psychological inflexibility compared to other students. Researchers believe the acceptance of physical suffering leads to the acceptance of emotional suffering in far too many cases. Psychologists Thomas Curran and Andrew Hill conducted a study about the effects of perfectionism. They found that it can be linked to an increase in eating disorders and depression. Dr. Brian Goonan works with dancers at Houston Ballet Academy and says that the same drive that pushes dancers to be great can also result in a deep depression. Ballet dancers are determined to settle for nothing less than perfection in pursuit of their art. But dancers at the Royal Opera House in London are getting science involved. The company has 97 dancers and 17 sports science and healthcare experts on hand to focus on every aspect of their physical health. Professor Emma Redding was once a dancer who says people thought science might dilute the art, but she helped found the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science, which seeks to strengthen dancers' bodies through new technology. These dancers need to be able to perform wearing special equipment and face masks designed to measure their muscle activity and oxygen uptake. Of course, it doesn't stay on during performances, but it helps collect valuable data that could change the future of the industry. Becoming a professional ballet dancer requires years of intense training, but has a surprisingly small financial payoff. Despite the hours of training and rehearsing, most ballet dancers in the United States make between $26,176 to $38,784 per year. Considering the 10 plus hour days, fierce competition, and exhausting auditions, it's clear ballet is not a fast track to getting rich. Of course, there are some stars who make up to $261,500 per year, but they're in the minority. On the lower end of the spectrum, many ballet dancers dancers make as little as $14,000 per year. As a result, it's not unusual for dancers to have a second job if they can squeeze one into their hectic schedules. And no small part of those paychecks goes to footwear. Point shoes are a basic requirement for ballet and they are not cheap. On average, they cost about $65 to $75 per pair, but can easily go up to $120 per pair depending on brand and quality. And don't think you can just replace them every few months or so. The better dancers get, the faster they burn through their footwear. A professional can easily go through a pair a day just by wearing them to class and rehearsal. During an intense performance, a dancer might go through multiple pairs in one night. Of course, they also have to be broken in, which is a time-intensive and sometimes painful process of breaking them in and making them pliable. Some dancers stuff them with glue and paper to make them a little bit stiffer and easier on the feet. Although there are many male ballet dancers, most performers are female, and yet it's women who are less likely to be in leadership positions. According to the Dance Data Project, in the 2018 to 2019 season, 81 percent of all works were choreographed by men, a mere 17 percent were choreographed by women, and the remaining 2 percent were either worked on by choreographers of multiple genders or they were undetermined. Not only are male dancers more likely to become artistic directors, but they also get paid more. In 2017, Dance Data Project reported that female artistic directors were paid only 68 cents for every dollar earned by their male counterparts. The average male was paid $224,347, while the average woman earned $153,442. And the wage gap isn't the only issue facing female ballet dancers. 
Alexandra Waterbury was involved with the New York City Ballet before she experienced what she refers to as the worst nightmare of every woman. She had been dating principal dancer Chase Finley when she discovered he was sending sensitive photos of her to his fellow dancers, including pictures taken without her knowledge. Alexandra filed a civil suit against the New York City Ballet as well as Chase and the two other principals at the time, Amar Ramasar and Zachary Catazzaro. She alleged that the company had a fraternity-like atmosphere, and she's not the only one. Her pending lawsuit alleges that there were other unnamed female victims in this case. It's clear that ballet is truly a lifestyle for those involved, but what happens when their careers end? In the world of ballet, there's a saying, a dancer dies twice. The end of a performer's career is emotionally devastating and it happens sooner than you might think. Most ballet dancers retire around the age of 40, whether they want to or not. Wendy Whelan found herself getting fewer and fewer roles as she got older. Eventually, she was told she could no longer dance as the Sugar Plum Fairy in The Nutcracker, a role she had for 22 years. At the Paris Opera Ballet, the mandatory retirement age is only 42, but some dancers don't make it that long and are forced to retire in their 30s when their bodies simply can't handle the strain of dancing any longer. When Wendy lost the part of the Sugar Plum Fairy, she thought of all she'd sacrificed for her career. She never took time off, and she put the thought of motherhood aside. While dancer Maya Makatelli made practicing ballet while pregnant look easy, in reality, it's anything but. The thought of having a child and shortening their already limited career is enough to convince many dancers to hold off, but by then, it might be too late. According to fertility experts, approximately 18% of women struggling with infertility are athletes, and it's a serious problem with dancers. The combination of constant physical stress and a limited diet can interfere with reproductive hormones, making it difficult to get pregnant even when a dancer's career is over. Do you think these challenges are necessary to become a professional ballet dancer, or is there a better way to celebrate the art form? Let us know what you think in the comment section, like this video, and subscribe for more from us here at The Taco. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.